Dear all, welcome to the CERL podcast. Today we have a great guest, Markus Pitzka, who is a pioneer in software renovations. Yeah. You can always buy bigger engines. Exactly. <laughs> to compensate for the flat tire. Yeah. We had one a case of one customer um, that uh, a very large bank, we saved them about 25 million euros a year. Why should you care about software renovations? Well, software renovations is about making sure that the systems you have invested in actually have a longer shelf life and actually exist and you don't have to buy new systems or replace them, which is super expensive and very high risk. So if you are in a company that has legacy systems, so anything from embedded systems to actually information systems you use on a daily basis that enables your organization, this podcast is for you because software innovation is a completely new way of looking at things and can have radical improvements with very low risks. So welcome and hope you enjoy. Welcome. Thank you, Tony. Pleasure to be here. I am really happy to have you here. So when I first met you, mm. Daniel told me about you before I met you and he basically said, I know Marcus does software renovations. And I was like, what is that? <laughs> and then I, okay, I, I get it. But Normally, you work with companies who have big systems, yep. so a bank or a hospital or a government agency or a company that has like systems of systems over many, many years, like legacy systems, 20, 30 years old, and it's a big mess. And generally, what I experienced is that you buy new ones to replace old ones. Mm. But you started a company called Itestra, and you work with software renovations. Can you explain it? Um, <clears throat> I like fixing things. That's how it all started. Yeah. So if something is broken, I don't really like to throw it away. I don't know really why. But um, I also enjoy fixing things. I started a PhD in computer science um, many years ago, which was on compiler construction and operating systems. So we did high-performance computing, distributed computing, and so on. At that time, it was in the 90s. And my task was more focused on the language and compiler construction. And I thought at that time... It would never make sense to start developing a new compiler from scratch for our distributed and parallel language. And I looked for other ways on how I could develop a compiler that is highly optimizing, suitable for high-performance computing. And then I selected uh, the GNU-C compiler, GCC, as a basis and started to adapt it and change it. What, what was at that time was a little bit unusual because there was no documentation about it and so on. And so we cut GCC in half and used the back end and um, introduced a new front end for our language uh, on the compiler. And that was quite successful. And what I learned from that is that um, on a general level is to perform innovation, you shouldn't always start from scratch. Yeah? Because the things that are there are way too big and too complicated. And to just waste the time just reproducing what has already been there. But isn't that kind of very common among engineers, especially not well, paid here? So you create something yeah. from scratch, even if you can reuse 10 other versions of something. Absolutely. It's a not yeah. invented here syndrome. And yeah. It's also a psychology, you know, reading foreign code, understanding... Um, concept that you haven't developed by yourself needs to have a lot of, uh, let's say, accept it, accepting and then understanding um, others' thoughts. Yeah? And, and that's one of the major barriers. But on the other hand, um, for innovation, uh, there's not much other choice, I think. Uh, but in, in, in very rare cases, innovation is just something that drops down and there's a new yeah. uh, idea from scratch and it's just newly built. It really needs to extension, adaptation of existing stuff, new integration and so on. Um, so existing stuff has to be understood. Yeah? Mm. And I experienced that myself, by the way, I wrote a paper about that one day about adapting on a, on a scientific conference about um, adapting GCC for that purpose. I got a, a, a best paper award, which was fun, and I enjoyed that. And, and afterwards, I decided to, well, uh, let's investigate how this um, is being done in commercial environments. Because I, I just knew it from this tiny research topic on compiler mm. construction, and then I wanted to generalize it on more uh, commercial bigger systems. Yeah? Instead of buying something new mm. or doing it from scratch, which is very common in, in exactly. big, big <clears throat> commercial enterprises, like you're replacing an old system with a new one yes, for twice the cost and three times the time, yeah. you're basically saying that 
look at what you already have yes. and can we do something smart with that for just as good as new but better really absolutely i mean it is actually just adding a new option mm. right instead of one further suffering with things that are not 100 suitable for what you need today mm. and with the old stuff instead of doing a risky project on the other hand with a new system whether it is ball um, bought or built yeah mm. another option is like you know starting to adapt and, and change and fix what you already have it's, it's just a third new option and i think that's a very viable option for many situations yeah. so let's say you have a bank take mm -hmm. a bank as an example because they've been working with systems and it for a very long time in comparison right yeah. normally you have like five or six big systems that are in the background uh, with a lot of information a lot of customer data etc Mm -hmm. And then you have often a middle layer with newer systems that are more adapted towards new business models. Yeah. And then you have new front ends. Bay internet banking, for example, yes. is fairly new. Mm -hmm. And of course, these need to be interconnected to some extent. Yes. But they also depend on each other. So it's the weakest link, really, right? So so True. if something goes down, True. And in this environment, it's not a system you're you're messing with. It's like twenty. 30 systems or more yeah or more and, and half of them files and architectures and all and <sighs> technology so it's a, a big zoom and then of course banks as an example don't consider them to be they, they don't consider themselves to be software companies but rather they consider them to be banks but in reality they are actually software companies because like most part at least yeah, yeah mm -hmm. i mean most things that they do internally is supported by software enabled by software mm -hmm. And their customers interact with software more or less all the time. And in this environment, you want to replace an old system, maybe because the the, the code base is old. You don't have programmers anymore. Yeah. Maybe um, maybe the licenses is wrong. Maybe there's no support for it. Maybe it's just slow um, or expensive, or and or, or infrastructure costs, it, or has a weak um, or um, how do you say? Um, long time to system for innovation, yeah. so new features, so maintainability is low, yeah. um, which is also cost and time to system. Uh, uh, yeah. So it's not just maintenance, it's also time to the market. Yeah, um, we generally call that legacy. Yes. I, I, But I always had a problem with legacy as a bad thing. Legacy is just where you are in your history. It can be good and bad, right? Yeah. I mean, it enables you, yeah. but it also hinders you. The more yeah. legacy you have, the better you can do your business. But the more legacy you have, the harder it is to change because you're hampered by the old things. I mean, legacy is a very um, difficult and um, um, term. Yeah, mm. I, I try to avoid it. Legacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because usually it is being used without any proper meaning. Yes. Yeah? It is usually used um, for like, I don't like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I haven't looked at it. I didn't understand it. Yeah. And I don't like it. So let's replace it. And that's what, what everybody then calls like a legacy, yeah? Yeah. which is like the general term on it. But it has no really meaning. What, what is it? So what we need to do and what we really do is dig deeper into it. What's its problem? Do you really have an infrastructure cost problem? Do you have a performance problem? Is this security? Is it functionality? What, yeah. what do you really want? That's a much more detailed view that is needed to develop a strategy because whatever you're going to do is going to be very, very expensive and last for a long time. Yeah. So you must come to a proper decision. Then it's not enough to say use a general term like legacy. You need to really pinpoint what 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 is my problem and what do I want to have in the future? What is uh, what What is my goal? Where do you want to be? Do you want to sell more policies? Do I want to reduce more my costs? Mm. Then you need to have a very concise view of what the situation and the requirements for the future are. And what you said before about uh, replacing systems and buying just a new one, introducing, yes, of course, this this uh, is, is a very frequent case. But what what is often forgotten about that? It's not enough to build a new system or introduce a new solution, a bought one, uh, for example, you also need to shut down what you already have. Yes. If you do that, if you take this road, yeah? And, that's and this is usually what doesn't work so easily because for that, you also need to migrate everything that you already have in the old system yes. existing. And this migration, it's called data migration. The problem is not the data migration. The problem is the functional migration. Yes. Because the data, for example, um, assumes that there are certain product logic of older projects we don't, you don't have in the new system. So often the, the, the result of uh, such replacement um, uh, projects, not all time, but in many cases, it results in duplication. 
Yeah. Yes. So you have the old and parts of the old and parts of the new system. And that's the worst case actually you can get. So this has to be avoided. Anyway. That's why I said uh, new system for twice the cost. At least during development. Yeah. And if you are um, uh, not but I, for tune, then for a long time afterwards still. Yeah? But I would say the norm is rather that you don't shut down this new old system completely, even yes. if that's the idea, because it's a matter of risk minimization not value optimization. So yeah. if it, I'm a manager, it, it, right? Even worse, Tony, yeah. um, if you buy a standard solution as it is often yeah. called, then you would also need to customize the standard solution heavily to your older products and your older data that yeah. you have. And that's what companies try to avoid. It's because it doesn't fit into the newer standard solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you end up with two solutions at the end, so you're doubling the costs. Which, which then continue, because the downside of losing something or risk of removing the old system is actually very high for the individual. Yeah. While for the company, it's a different discussion, right? So if I'm a manager and I say, okay, I'm buying a new system, right? And I put my credibility on the line for a huge investment, right? Hundreds of millions over many years. And then when the project is delivered and the system is working, the new one, right? Even if it's working well, there's no upside for me to shutting down the old one because I take a risk. The idea with the Testra, you basically go in and do what? So what we do first is we, we perform a health check. It's an interesting on how many companies don't really know how big their systems are. Yeah. Uh, and size makes a big difference. Yeah. And it's the same with software. Like um, a small thing can just be replaced, no question. Yeah? But if you're talking about 30, 60 million lines of code, there's no way of replacing that. That's just impossible financially, um, usually. And also pinpoint what is the actual problem. Mm. That's the question. What is the actual problem? Is it really costs? Is it a lack of skills? We say we are not able to hire people for this technology anymore. It has to be a really clear problem statement, yeah. um, first of all. Because I, I actually think that many people see, oh, it's an old system, so we need to replace it, right? Exactly. It, it, they kind of see it as a, as, as a law of nature. Exactly. And there's really no reason to do that. No. Yeah, I can just say for, if some companies are listening for this conversation, don't do that. Yeah. Because there is no reason for that. I mean, a Java system is not necessarily better than a COBOL system. Yeah. Let's say, uh, so I, I'm a banker. Yes. Right. And I'm kind of a big boss in the bank. So I have some power. Yeah. I have a big legacy system of loan analysis that all of my anal analysts use in the bank, right? Mm -hmm. Thousands of people. And they need this for their daily work. It's not a front-end thing. Mm -hmm. It's a front-end internally in the company. Mm -hmm. And it's really old and I can't find developers for it. I need to extend the functionality. It's also slow and old interface. Really, you know, we need to fix it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you fix it for me? Oh, yes, I can. That's for sure. There are so many opportunities to reshape it, refactor it, re-architecture, change the platform, extend it, functionality, fix it, whatsoever. You can do hundreds of different things with software. The key is understanding the gap. So one of my pet peeves, one of the things I irritate myself a lot, a lot is when I hear the word digitalization. The reason for it is not because it's a bad or good idea, it's because it's a self-fulfilling thing, right? <coughs> so so I, we have a budget to digitize. We need to improve and reduce costs. That's generally right. And, 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 and then we have this much money. Mm -hmm. Let's replace the system. My philosophy is rather why. What do you want and, and why do you want it, yeah. as you said, to mm -hmm. figure out the strategy. But you might end up actually talking to your clients then mm -hmm. for renovations and they figuring out that they actually don't need to change the system, but need yeah. to change something else. Is this part of a Testro's business strategy to yes. actually, okay? So we do a lot of consulting then on the business too to say what, what really makes sense for the business. I remember a situation I was talking to a chief executive of an insurance company. And uh, before we came there, he, he was very clear that uh, they are going to buy a new solution and replace the whole landscape. And I asked the question, like, how many more policies are you going to sell with it? And he asked me, well, what do you mean by this question? And he was almost getting mad at me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but actually at the end, he, he rewarded it. He said like, well, that's a good question. So we haven't thought about it really. And we, they really hadn't because they just were thinking about legacy. But I, I think that concrete goals in the beginning, so you're forced to be concrete what you want to achieve and also how to measure yes. success. Yes. Because I think one of the fundamental problems with goal 
discussions, right? In general, it's too fluffy. I mean, there are two parts, right? One, okay, I want to sell more policies, example. But the second is, okay, how many and how are you going to measure it afterwards? Yeah. Because that's how you know definition of done. Otherwise, it's just, oh, I would like to be better. I mean, the easiest thing you could do in a test run is when a uh, boss comes to you and basically says, I want a new system, you could say, of course, we'll fix the new system and then underbid everybody else. Yes. Because you know what you're going to deliver is going to be not good. And then they have to pay you to fix it forever. Absolutely. Right? That's the easy way out. (laughs) Right? I mean, if you want to make money and don't care, that's the easy way out. Mm -hmm. But you don't do that. You actually force them to really think about their decisions and what they want to achieve. Yes, that's the point. Initially. I I really like the idea because I I call that honest consulting. It is. It is. um, It's a little bit against the stream. So it is good. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it makes it quite exhausting <laughs> because yeah. it's not what, what people or customers in particular expect from you. No. It's not because you're not giving a simple answer that makes it really exhausting. If you're doing new development, a solution, um, software engineering project, new development, you have to do it quickly or it's gone. Mm. For a renovation project, the decision process often takes years. However, during this time, the need for the renovation does not decrease, it increases. Yeah. yeah? Because with everything, the technical depth that is not reduced, and it's not just technical depth, but the depth that is in the te- technology, it increases over time. Every organization, really, that is not buying complete services, but basically have systems of some sort. So most big companies, organizations, government, doesn't really matter. The second they u- start using it, it's aging and changing. Absolutely. The second when it is first being built, during its build. It yeah, that's already... Exactly. <laughs> but, I, but I think people have the wrong philosophy. Let's just take a, a manufacturing, right? Mm-hmm. You know that you have a bunch of machines that manufacture something. Let's say yeah. a car, right? And you know there are three parts there. One is, well, what goes into it in terms of manpower and material. And the other one is machines and software that c- controls the machines. But the third is actually the wear and tear of the machines. Mm-hmm. And we don't have that philosophy in software. The, right. the assumption is you buy software, it's, it's forever. No, yeah. it has wear and tear. Yeah. And wear and tear then needs to be either maintained, so you mm-hmm. kind of patch the machines, repair them, service them, mm-hmm. right? And this is co- kind of maintenance. But you also have a lifespan of the machines where it's cheaper to replace it yeah. than it is to, to actually patch it. But then you can actually see software innovations as refurbishing the machine. So instead of replacing the machine with a new one, you can actually take the machine and refurbish it. But while you're doing the refurbishing, you can also improve it. Yeah. I think the manufacturing analogy is better because you actually see that things have a lifespan and they go through wear and tear at the same time that they need to be expanded and improved. You can go from machine to machine. You don't replace all machines at the same time. Exactly. What many don't think about is this. You see a software, yeah, 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 just develop the software, right? And then you just replace it. No, no, no. No, no, no. There's more cost in making it work properly, often, than it is actually doing the coding. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, in your production line, you know, 10-minute break, so you close down the production for 10 minutes, you can measure it very easily how much you lose. Mm -hmm. But for software, for some reason, there's an assumption that this is easy. No, it's you're breaking the production line or whatever you're doing in your company. Yeah. What if you, you buy a new machine and then you put the old machine next to it and you run both in parallel, right? That's like two systems in parallel. And, and we are not talking, if we talk about large-scale business systems, we are not talking about a machine. We are talking about the foundation of the complete thing. Yes, yes. Yeah? So this is a really, really big yes. machine. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're talking about like the electricity. Yeah? Yes, yeah, you yes. You cannot shut this down and put this at risk. It's just way too big. If you talk about an average large bank or insurance company, we talk about 50 to 100 million lines of code just in the back end. We're not counting the front ends, not the, yeah. app, not the, the apps and so on, and not the clerks. We're just talking about the logic. Let's take 50 million lines of code. That means if you want to build them anew, we are talking about 500 million euros or 1 billion euros yeah. just to implement this new, because that's how much it would cost. This is just uh, absolute unrealistic. Mm. But let me maybe, maybe talk about what we actually do with, yes. with this system. So what, what can be done with renovation actually means? So what, what are the options? After we pinpoint the problems, we have a whole variety of options what we can, can do. One is, for example, is just performance improvement. It's mm. like 
changing the heating system or better windows. Yeah? We have done this heavily after 2008, after the Lehman crash. Oh. At that time, the IT budgets became um, um, uh, well reduced. Yeah? So money was, uh, was uh, tight, tight yeah? and the IT budgets went down. So many large-scale companies were trying to find uh, possibilities to save money without um, you know, um, reducing functionality of the business, mm. without hampering the business. So software performance improvement, uh, let me say first, so reducing infrastructure costs was a very um, um, good option, uh, a very attractive option. Because you don't, um, uh, you know, you're not uh, losing any business, yeah? not any functionality, um, but you're just um, reducing cost for licenses. How are you doing? How are you doing that? This is software performance, performance optimization. Because in large data centers, uh, the license costs are proportional to the CPU cycles you use. Yes, it's the same in the cloud, actually, pretty much. Yeah. So yeah. if you have Weak algorithms, weak algorithmic structures. You need more servers. You need more nodes, and then your your prices go up. And the prices are enormous. Yeah. yeah. So the infrastructure costs make a huge share of the IT costs. Yeah. So if you have um, better algorithms, you save a lot of money. So one first thing we did really ac activity we did really actively for several years was just performance improvement as renovation. That's how easy it is at the end. How how, how concrete. Yeah. You find algorithms in large systems that perform weakly, replace them with standard computer science algorithms, like replace a bubble sort with a um, with a quick sort, yeah, and you have amazing differences. You save like ninety percent of your CPU costs. Yeah, we had one a case of one customer um, that uh, a very large bank. We saved them about twenty five million euros a year in algorithm. just optimizing just algorithms. 60 person days. Yeah. 60. 20, 60 person days. 60 person days. Algorithmic performance optimization. So changing some core algorithms. Mm. Um, over 25 million euros a year. That's a, a lot. License. That's a lot. And this was, we made this experience. With very low risk. When you change an algorithm of an existing system, you can always test the new solution against the old solution. Yeah. And, and you have mass data already. Yeah. Because you can... Um, Use the data that is available and test it uh, excessively, and then you're absolutely safe, pretty much. Yeah, and uh, the the success of that is enormously. That, that's like, you know, you're going to a house, um, or you 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 look at a car. It spends like twenty liters um, on hundred kilometers, and you say, like, well, you have flat tires. Yeah, you just have to know how flat tires look like. Yeah. yeah, how to find them, how to spot them, and it's amazing if you look at the older systems. It's very easy because uh, I once got a code base in old um, old programming language, 25 million lines of code from a global company, 25 million. And they do heavily transaction processing, a lot of infrastructure costs. We are talking about more than 100 million euros a year. And then you try to find out one smart data structure. Is there one? You use a grab, you see like um, hash, um, trees, um, maps, whatever. Mm. He get no hit, no. So if you look at the large business system of a global company with 25 million lines of code and you find not a single incident, a hint on a smart data structure, how likely is it that it is uh, performing well? No, but maybe, but, but I think... The performance is awful. Yeah, but the, I, I think there was an assumption early on that you went from your own servers, right, and your yeah. own infrastructure to cloud, right? No, th th that was all data center. Yeah, but but... You kind of moved it out to, to the experts, and the assumption was that would reduce costs and save, the, yeah, fix yeah. the problem. Yeah. No, because now you're just paying for cycles or storage. Yes. yes. Since you basically just added hardware internally. Yes. Right to fix the problem. Yeah. You basically assume, yeah, yeah, no, the hardware is cheaper in the cloud. Yeah. Right. I don't have to care about it. I don't have people caring about it. Right. I just buy the service from a big, big. Uh, cloud vendor. This is cheaper on the price sheet. Yeah. yeah, and but then it turns out to be an escalating cost because if your business grows proportion, uh, the, the actual cost doesn't grow proportionally. It grows exponentially, more or less, right? So if the system is adapted for hundred thousand transactions and you end up with ten million transactions, it's not linear. Well, it's 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 good to have a cheaper provider, but if your tires are flat, 
It doesn't matter. Tires are flat. Yes. Yeah. So first fill them with air. You can always buy bigger engines. Exactly. <laughs> to compensate for the flat tire. Yeah. But I, I think... That but, but first fix the problem right there. And it's, I, I think that's a, a little bit of a challenge we, what we have in computer science to make this visible. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think we as... I'm a computer scientist too. And um, we, our discipline has not been good to explain no. um, what we do in economic terms. Yeah. And that, that's our fault. Yeah? Hmm. We have to make visible what the econo uh, economic consequences are of having a bubble sort instead of a quick sort. Yeah. Yeah? And, and I'm just making this simple example yes. because you can uh, uh, transfer this to whole architectures and so on. But they are dramatic. We are talking not about 5 or 10% differences. We are talking about 80 and 90% differences yeah. in algorithmic consequences. And if you do this directed goal-driven, yeah, um, on certain systems, you have dramatic success in reducing the infrastructure with cost. very low risk with and very, very short investments, absolutely. small investments in comparison to buying a new system. Because I think that's kind of the, oh, my tires are flat. I, I start by buying new engines, bigger engines to compensate. More gas, more engines. Then when the new engine doesn't fit yeah. and it's not fast enough, I just buy a new car. No, figure out that the tires are flat and pump the tires. Yes. And you can run for 10, 15 more years. Yeah. And, and then the argument is, well, I need to replace it eventually. Yes, but t 10, 15 more years of runtime mm -hmm. is huge in terms of costs. Yes. And technology goes further, Amazing, which means yeah. you might actually have a lower cost in the end of the 10, 15 years to yes. replace it, yes. if you have to. And the problem is with the tire picture, everyone can spot it because you see it. Yes. Yeah. Everybody can spot it. Yeah. Mm. With software, the problem is it's not visible. Yeah, it's just a huge bulk of software nobody understands and, and usually sees. Yeah? Yeah. It's very hard to see. But you cannot also easily show it to somebody. Yeah. Therefore, you need to take a software x-ray. Yeah, yeah. Yeah? You have to take the x-ray of it. It's like your, your he knee always hurts. Why is it? Yeah? Let's take it. No, buy That's your actually knee. what no, no, <laughs> buy your knee or run faster. Yeah, yeah run faster. <laughs> problem solved. Yeah, yeah. No, um, you have to take, do the X ray to do a proper analysis of the problem. Yeah. And doing the software X ray is the same same principle. I like that strategy. analogy. You do the software uh, X ray yeah. and then you can really pinpoint the problem. Mm -hmm. yeah? And then you might find amazingly simple answers to to the to the real problems yeah. in some cases and as i said we did many years of software performance improvement it was very successful and i think there's a huge potential again and not just in old systems new systems often if they are built nowadays with current technologies they have horrible performance yeah. with object or, or our mapping object mappings and all that it's horrible to some extent it's all being paid for uh, in the cloud or in other data centers yeah. and there's a huge huge room for improvement then we moved on from performance improvement as a major uh, renovation activity, which was very much targeted toward cost, to cleanup. It's the same. Uh, you, if a system is not maintainable, and um, there is actually not a system that is not maintainable. It's called maintainable leg legacy, but there is no, no maintain. Anything can be maintained. It's a question of effort. Cost. Yes. It's a question of time and effort and understanding. And sometimes the effort has to do with who is reading it. Mm. Yeah, it's not the system, it's the people who are doing it also. Yeah? Mm. So again, we have to find out what is the real problem. Is it duplication? Is it unused? Is it dead code? Is it missing structure? And now if I'm listing this, you, you can easily, you probably already think, oh, all of this can be fixed. I can remove duplication. I can remove dead code, unused code. I can refactor an architecture. So it's all possible. So you just need to look very clearly again. What are the problems here? What is reducing our maintainability? What is increasing our effort? Is it missing documentation? Well, write a new documentation. Mm. Redocument. We did this for actually for an assembler system, a life policy management system, an insurance company. This was still 100% assembler implemented. It was coming from the Siemens BS1000. Yeah? Was then migrated to a set series on IBM and still in assembler implement. In, even printing the policies and all was all in assembler. Totally, totally. We are not talking about a few assembler modules. It's the whole system, million lines of code in, in assembler. And of course, it was developed by the same people over 45 years. It was called totally, totally unmaintainable. Of course, it's not. It is maintainable. They are, they are maintaining it. It's just mm. hard to get the knowledge. Mm. So document it basically. I mean, you don't want to keep this forever in that state, but, you know, go step by step to say so first re-establish the knowledge about it and what problems are we talking about where do you really need to actually touch the code you don't touch the whole system all no. the time yeah 
So, and then you get a plan again what you do. So, mm. performance improvement, redocumentation, um, refactoring, cleanup of code is all detailed measures. And then we got more and more into full scale replace, um, let's say full scale renovation or re engineering, where you say, like, only the facade is still there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the rest is <laughs> the replaced. The rest is being built, but it's still a big difference to new development. Mm. Because when you do new development, where do the requirements come from? Yeah. You need a business department, you need product owners, which you usually don't have. You need a clear, concise specification with, um, without ambiguity. Usually you don't have that. And the effort for that is just in, enormous. That's mm. how we actually did then, uh, how we won our first really big re-engineering project where we uh, replaced the system that was previously implemented for an insurance company in RPG on the i-series. And we transformed it totally into Java and webs, uh, Java web and service oriented. The key was doing it out without, without the business department, requiring them to invest the effort for the specification. So we developed a specification out of the existing system. Yeah. You can extract the use cases out of it yeah, and then retransform it into a proper future architecture, yeah. which is a manual process and not an automated one. Yeah? But we're basically talking about renovating the, the, the technology rather than actually renovating the idea behind the system. Because the system then becomes the stakeholder. It becomes the customer, really, the system, because you're basically taking the old system and replacing it yeah. with a better one. I think there's huge potential in making sure, because the business model is flawed. The people who sell you new systems also sell you the services for bad cycles. So it's <laughs> so so you have a big vendor. So I'm a big company. I sell you a new insurance system yeah. for your insurance company. Of course, I have a partnership with a huge cloud vendor. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> and of course, you make money hand over fist in every direction except the company. And the company, once you invest a couple of hundred million into it, it's very hard to back out and say this is the wrong direction. Yeah. So it's an it's kind of a, a servitude forever. And you're too afraid to touch it, right? Yeah. It's somebody else's problem. I'll wait until I get promoted, then somebody else can take yeah. over my problem, right? And the maintenance people, they can be really good. But the problem is, if they break something, they get yelled at. But if they improve something, nobody measures the improvement. Mm -hmm. So what's my reward? None. Mm -hmm. That's why I think it's very hard for an internal company, internal maintenance department, yes. to do this. Because they have a budget, and the more maintenance costs they have, the larger their budget, the more mm -hmm. people they have. Mm -hmm. And so, you're, you're going to be, uh, you're absolutely right, you're going to act very restrictively. You're going to be risk minimization instead of value optimization. Yes. I see it test drives what a maintenance, more, but still what the maintenance department or evolution department should be doing mm -hmm. every day. Yeah. But it's easier because you don't have the same reward system. You don't have a fixed budget with employees. That's absolutely true. We have a big advantage as an external legal entity that we can also take the complete risk for it, of yeah. it. We can take the risk away. Yeah. yeah. Um, we often offer our customers then um, success-based pricing. Is that like, you know we I guarantee you fifty percent um, reduction of the infrastructure cost. When people hear this, they're going to say infrastructure. Who cares? No, no, no. No, no. This is monster big. Millions. Yeah. So if you have a, a total IT investment cost of a hundred million, yeah, let's say. And you have, say, uh, two million in maintenance costs of that system. Mm -hmm. you, your cycle costs, so basically the servers you're paying for and the cycles you're paying for can be 10, 15 million per year yes. for 20 years. Yes. Yes. And, and that's what people miss. Oh, it's a big investment. No, no, no. no, no. But then you have 10, 20 million in leakages for making sure that system works for 20 years yeah. every year. And if it works bad, you still have the cost, but it just doesn't support your business. We can also say, I'm doing this for a fixed price, yeah? and you only pay me at the end, and the whole system is there and it's working and the old one is shut down. Have you had a situation where you went into this way of thinking in terms of uh, consultancy and, and renovations and didn't get paid? So have you no. failed? No, it doesn't happen. Is that because, no, and I'm being it, hardball, had, is that because be you're honest, bad? We had one case where we like guaranteed like 50% and we only gave 40%. So we... Only. Well, yeah, <laughs> we had to give a discount on that, um, um, and um, which was fair, absolute fair enough. Uh, and yeah. you know, everybody was happy about that. But, but do you remember how much? that it really didn't work. What was the volume of that project? And 
what was the yearly saving of 40? Well, I, I, this is several years ago. I really can't give you the numbers. Okay. But what I can say is that when you have this, this uh, success-based pricing, mm -hmm. we usually deliver a table, a price table that lists the the savings uh, on the one hand and the price on the other hand. So it's not just one, a zero or nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we have, and, and the, the key behind this is always to make like a return on investment or break even within like 12 months or even less or so on. Yeah. So what you're That's saying how is... how it is being computed. Uh -huh. yeah? Okay. Yeah? If the company invests one euro with you, <laughs> what would you say a, a normal return? Is it 20 cents? I have to calculate it, but when I look at the business cases that we calculated at that time, it's uh, as I said, this was more like in between 2009 and 2015 because the budgets were low at that time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we always had return on uh, break evens within like one year. So, so basically, the entire investment was zero after one year. Mm -hmm. Yes. Given cost reductions yes. of. Oh. Yes. That's really good. It is not as dramatic if you do other renovation activities mm -hmm. like. Uh, a full-scale replacement, re-engineering. Yeah. But then we have this um, example from a bank where we re-engineered the whole um, uh, core landscape over uh, several years. And now we have about, I think, one-fourth of the maintenance costs. One-fourth of ongoing development and maintenance. So this time we are not talking about infrastructure. We're yeah. talking about pe people and time, time to system. Huh? Mm. It's like... 75% saved. But that's probably more money. What it's hard to say because, you know, it has an impact on the business. That yeah. You yeah. Cannot, the, the problem is in this case is you cannot compute it so easily because it has so many dependencies and effects. Yes. Uh, let's say it's strategically super valuable. So I'm sitting in a bank. Mm -hmm. I'm working in a bank, right? I'm not an IT person. I'm sitting doing loan analysis and mm -hmm. giving out house loans, right? When I do this, I basically do a couple of things. I collect some information. I have some systems for this, right? And talk to the customers. And then I fill in some information in the system and that gives me a credit score maybe. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of look at the history of the, of, of the client and I use another system. And then I set up the loan and maybe use a fourth system, mm -hmm. right? And let's say this process takes me an hour. Times this with 10,000 people. Yes, exactly. So one hour, that's 10,000 hours in one day. In a, you have the ball, you know, Excel ball rolling and waiting for the system or the system goes down, right? Oh, all of a sudden it's two hours. That's a difference of 10,000 person hours per day. This is the exactly. real cost of IT. There are also situations like if you look at a large production company or also bank, but look at an industrial companies, if they cannot produce cars for half a day yeah, um, because a core system is not available. Yeah. And it, it really happens. Yeah? Yes. And this can also be fixed, like find out what yeah. are the risk factors in the system and so on. But I think the big breakdowns are easily observable and, and, oh, we need to fix this, right? So I'm not saying they're they're le less important. The, the, That's not what I mean. The question is what are the future breakdown possibilities? The thing that most miss mm -hmm. is that, give you another um, simple example. We did a study uh, at, the, at the big financial vendor where we basically looked at the personal uh, money cost for a laptop. So every employee has a laptop, right? Mm -hmm. And they kind of minimize the cost of those laptops, mm -hmm. right? Because it's an IT budget and that should be minimum. So they said 1,500 euros for a laptop and you use it for three years, right? Mm -hmm. And then we, tell, we ask people, how much do you wait for your system? You know, when you try to open Excel, it takes mm -hmm. time before it loads, you know, boot up, etc. Just personal computer. And we figured out that if they double the investment in the personal laptop, so from 1,500 euros to 3,000 euros, it took them six weeks of lost work time to count that investment home. Mm -hmm. And the same can be said for the systems in a bank, right? Which is not systems. It's like a, a huge infrastructure. It's huge. It's, it's a huge amount of systems that interact. Mm -hmm. And the weakest denominator here basically causes you to have work delays and that time when people are sitting and, and being frustrated or not being able to do their work, this is very seldom calculated, right? Very seldom, yeah. And, and yeah. there I think renovations is really cool because you can just take what already works and just make it better. And exactly, and you can focus on the points where the pain really is. So it's one thing to, to renovate. How do you handle innovation there? Say 80% just needs to be fixed so it works well. Mm -hmm. That's renovations, yes. right? 
No, I, I consider both renovations, also adding functionality. But the 20% that's new, right? So basically yes. they need a new, faster way to introduce new policies in an insurance company or or a new way to okay, check. Sometimes you have just cross-cutting stuff, like you, we need to have support multiple currencies. Yeah. Like multinationality, uh, um, we will do an international business in the future. Yeah. yeah. So you have to open new languages um, and now we want to have um, a mobile application that's going to be used even during night. So we have the, the different um, processing scheme. We can just rely on uh, from nine to, uh, to five. But that's also what we put at the beginning in developing the renovation strategy. As I said, it's what, what is the problem up front? Is it more a technical problem? And it's so interesting. You get all kinds of situations. And we have this discussed, uh, spend way too much time on this performance topic, so I'm not repeating that. Yeah. But you also have this like, you know, I have this outdated platform I want to get rid of. If I want to shut down my mainframe. But then you also have have, you know, I'm missing this functionality and missing this, uh, the, the, um, the people to implement this, to maintain, maintain um, mm. the resources and all of that. And then you develop this plan and the requirements gap that you're talking about to say like missing functionality just goes into that. Yeah. How big is this of a problem? Sometimes, you know, this, this is a major driver. Uh, sometimes it's just a part of it and then you just mix it into the strategy and then you decide I'm going to do it first on the fly, doing it uh, at the end. Depends on the priority. You... But it's a very frequent case when you do a more full-fledged renovation, it's called re-engineering. Yeah. Yeah? Then you always say like, um, well, I have like a pop probably 80% of what is there will still be the truth. Yeah? Yeah. You're still having a similar business. <laughs> the yes. insurance companies will not sell chewing gums afterwards. No. Yeah? So it's still going to be an insurance business. But you add, um, of course, a delta requirements. So yeah. we collect them. What we practically do, we collect all delta requirements up front when you develop the strategy. As I said before, we look at the system, but we also collect all open backlogs. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look into the backlogs what, and then yeah. derive a plan for that for the future architecture. How how will this affect the future architecture and so on? And then I can tell you, well, do you need a completely different architecture to be able to do this? Or is it just an extension of this? Yeah. what is there? Yeah? But I think there's a also common misconception, especially in the last 10, 15 years, is I, I really I really hate it personally, but it's agile, right? And the assumption of some people in agile is we have no clue what's happening, so no planning. No, no, no. Agile doesn't say that. Nee. They say un we shouldn't unnecessarily plan. You should prepare for change. You should throw out the bad things fast, that kind of thing. Yeah. And this works very well because you're when you're doing renovations, you're uniquely positioned to know exactly what how things can be changed. Mm -hmm. but also how things can be added. Absolutely. And I, I completely agree with that. I mean, um, when the Agile methods came up, I, I was really a big advocate of it. Yes, yeah? yes. And, and the Agile manifesto says nothing about you shouldn't think about ahead. No. It just turned out to become a fashion. Yeah, yeah but they're like, well, we can just work from item to item to item. This is just a lie. This is just total no. control. Software is utterly difficult to change. Yeah? And the effort is enormous to change software, except from tiny, irrelevant stuff. Yes. Yeah? So you always have to think and plan ahead. I yeah? think one of the common misconceptions is you're completely independent and you can change every day. No, mm -hmm. that's not the point. You take responsibility for changes and you realize that there are changes happening because you learn what you're doing. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then you have to do a root cause analysis and a risk analysis for the change. Sometimes you actually have to avoid an optimization because the impact of the change is too large. And vice versa. And vice versa. Yeah. yeah. And, and so it's, again, it's understanding the whole, yeah. the whole object you're talking yeah. about. It's also, uh, this is interesting in the commercial environment, what we do, that you know, if you talk, of, for, for example, in the same industry hmm. to a mid-sized company instead of a large-scale company, you have to take different decisions, of course, because of course. the level of automation is just different. If you process one million contracts a day, uh, a year, whatever, mm. um, instead of 50,000 contracts, it makes a whole difference on the level it of does. automation that you need. It does. Yeah? So you have to take complete different design decisions. That's what makes it so interesting. What's your opinion on... On the one hand, you would like a homogenous way of working, right? So yeah. everybody fills in the loan application in the same way, independent of market, independent of who you are, because then you can streamline the system and optimize it. On the other hand, you have different traditions and different ways of thinking in different places. 
Mm -hmm. So then you get heterogeneous solution. One feature can be implemented in 20 different ways depending on. So would you say it's easier to streamline the organization so they work in one way and you have one system supporting it? Or would you say it's better to be flexible and offer multiple ways of working in the system? Within the organization. Within the organization. Streamline it as far as it is possible. Yeah. I have to explain, you know, the desire to streamline is always very strong. Yeah. yeah? And of course, upfront, everybody says, we need to streamline this, come to the same solution. Yes, of course. Yeah. But in most cases, there's a reason why it is not being yes. streamlined. There are different requirements and there are uh, that exist for a good reason. Turns then often out that it is not so easy to streamline yeah. that and that these differences are indeed needed. Yeah? Yeah. That department A does have different needs than department B. Yeah? Exactly. Like uh, a sales representative does have a different salary scheme uh, than a clerk that is does customer support. So you have completely different requirements that are needed. Uh, one of the real complexities of systems is that you need multiple ways of implementing the same functionality in some cases. Yes. So even if you have a one sales department, it's not really one sales department because it might be spread over two, con three continents, right? And 50 yes. countries. Yes. And all of a sudden, it's not the same. No, there it, is no it, streamlining. Yes, structure. the company name is here. It's yeah. the same formal yeah. company, but it's different traditions, different ways of attracting customers, yeah. different, you know? So, so it's even more complex in a legacy context yes. than you actually think about in the front. So I do understand why it's so forgiving to go for performance issues mm -hmm. because you can have huge impact with fairly low risk. But the second you start tinkering with how people do their work, yeah. the complexity is exponentially large. Yeah, it, it is very large, but the principle is the same. Yeah. So this is for me, the, it's quite interesting. These are really completely different steps to say like understanding what is there and also properly understanding what is needed. Often you have some vague vision of where you would like to be, mm -hmm. too vague, mm -hmm. a lot. Like um, the worst case I've seen is we have a hundred million in budget and we should digitize. No. And I'm like, <laughs> that's not a goal. <laughs> why? Yeah. It's like, because we have the budget and you know, everybody is doing it. So we let's have to do it. it. Let's spend it. I'm like racking my brain how to not insult the person in question, right? At <laughs> the same time, right? Because this is, very, uh, we have a digitalization plan. It's like good for you. What's the problem you're trying to solve? <laughs> the, no, this is no joke. This is very usual. Yeah. What I really like about the idea with renovations is one, you don't have to uh, invent the wheel again. Yep. You don't have to rely on only people for requirements, but you can actually base it on the current system. That's a really big difference. Big one. And what I also like a lot is you can do multiple improvements. So you can look at the situation, figure out where you're going, be more concrete about that. You're consultancy where you actually force the client to actually say this is what we want to achieve and then you can actually figure out the measurements if we succeeded you base the cost model on that and the reward models so return on investment so yes. honest you can also see okay here i can do fast stuff like improve algorithms to reduce cycles and save you 20 percent of your budget but then you can actually use parts of that and turn it around and say the difficult thing is how people interact with the system. So we'll put more money and effort into this part, mm -hmm. right? So you can kind of do exactly all of them at the same time, which means that some will be easy wins. Mm -hmm. Some will be costly wins, yeah. right? And you can kind of even it out. You can control it on a very fine grained level. Yeah. And last but not least, you're keeping your competitive advantage. And the truth is in, um, in business systems, there is usually no standard. If we look, uh, don't look at a rather trivial uh, cross-cutting um, uh, stuff like scanning, printing, or maybe a, an address register, it will always be individual so to some extent. Otherwise, there's no justification for you to exist. Yeah. Yeah, so it, there will be differences, and these differences might heavily or will heavily reflect in the software. Yeah, huh? that's also why there is no CD-ROM or DVD you install. This is my insurance company, and then you're off. The you can't. No, you can't. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. <laughs> Damn it! But that's why those standards are usually very large projects because. But in, not, and even yeah? in standardized standardized systems like you know the huge vendors SAP yeah. etc. I'm not saying good or bad yeah. SAP. I'm taking as an example of a really successful huge vendor, right? Yeah. You're not buying SAP. You're buying the concept and the direction of SAP, but then 
it's literally the cost is adapting it completely to your business, which means your SAP implementation is really your system. And it's unique. And it's unique. And, and so SAP, in five companies have SAP, so they have the same system. No, 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 no. No, no, no. No, that's like saying five companies have a car, they have the same car. No, the concept of car is car the same. would it be similar? But it can be literally that. a Ferrari compared to a van. Of course, we have to differentiate to about like more standard service, like you pay payroll and so on, which yep. is standardized. It has regulation, legal stuff behind it. Of course, that makes absolutely sense. Yeah. Because this is not your business. Exactly. Your business is a bank, is insurance, is a car manufacturer, and so on. Your business is not payroll. No. Yeah? So therefore, you can buy a suit. And it's quite yeah? smart to leverage the competence of, yeah. let's take SAP again as a positive example. They have huge domain knowledge in many domains and, yes. and a really good, smart super rich, uh, feature rich systems yeah. that they can sell you. You don't have to figure out how to pay payroll if you're doing car manufacturing. It's exactly. not your job. Well, then buy, buy SAP or buy something else. But yeah, anything that's, that, yeah. that's kind of the core of your business that but enables you talk about your business. The core of your business, yeah. car manufacturing, there's no standard solution. And there should Car manufacturing, be. there isn't one. No? Yeah, because the strategy is, is quite different. One company says for cars, like our strategy is you can customize your car. Yep. Yeah? The other one says uh, we have the driving experience or whatsoever has a completely different goal, like or it's more exclusive. With, yes. uh, yeah. So it's it's all of this needs different IT systems. And yeah. Like it's not the same. One of the things I've observed in many companies and organizations is that the people who literally have the money for IT generally have no idea what it is because they're not trained in that. So I understand it's nice with fresh, you know, fresh windows installed, right? Oh, yeah, okay, it's a lot of work, but you know, at least it's fresh. It's probably better. Yeah. You still get something new after renovation. The only difference is you don't take as much risk. I slightly disagree with you. Okay. Yeah. If you, if you look at the cost structures, the IT costs are usually around 3%. That's what we are. A software. Yeah. And yeah, now this is just as unfair as your statement, probably. <laughs> yes. Yes. Because but, it's but, wrong also. Well, it's yeah. also wrong. Yeah. yeah. But um, but the truth is, you know, a, a bank is a bank and a car is a car manufacturer and they have so many different tasks. And someone who is doing furniture uh, trading has a furniture business, yeah, which is not software. The only point is it is software intensive. Yes. So it needs a lot of software, just as it needs other stuff too. It needs cars, it needs power, energy, it needs space and buildings and all of that. And that's what we are. Yeah, mm -hmm. we are a service. We are, um, and, and I'm happy to be so. Yeah, we are, we are infrastructure, but we are an important one, a very important infrastructure that has to to have a very close fit to the business. That's quite unique, I think. Yeah? That's a little bit different from power. Right? Yeah, but, it, but we it's have also to be very close to the business, understand it and support it adic adequately. And, and therefore, I, I also disagree a little bit with, with the view that not that the knowledge about it is, 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 is not available too much. As I said before, I think we just as in our role as IT, mm have to become better in explaining the economic impact of, of, of... Oh, I agree with that. And and that's what we are missing. That's what we are missing a little bit in education already. Mm. Yeah? In university, university, I haven't really learned that. Yeah, mm. And and there's, um, uh, what's it called? There's informatic and, um, and Wirtschaftsinformatic. What's it in, in, in English? I don't know. Info informatics. For, uh, for, uh, for, but there's economic um, computer science, but they usually develop software system for businesses and not talking about the economics of software. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. The economics of software, yeah. yeah? And the, the really long range of <coughs> economics of software. And that's actually how we get into this legacy problem. I agree. And since this is gap is there, the actions that are taken are sometimes not optimal in both ways. It's not reacted soon enough mm. or it's overreacted. Yeah, and, and the wrong decisions are made. Yeah, so when I say software companies, I don't mean literally software companies. What I mean is the people who actually take decisions on, 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 on who have the money really yes. in the company, yeah. they see IT or systems as a cost. They don't see it as an enabler necessarily. Yes, they do to some extent, but they, they do. but they don't see it as the enabler. It's like electricity. I'm not sure. If you actually add electricity to a plant, then you increase the volume, right? So let's say you double the volume in a car company for production. Electricity is going to be more than double. But you don't understand that's the same for software. 
And, and, and I think that there's an assumption you have a system, it's bought, it's done, buy a new one, replace it, it's a module. No, it, it's like... It's like but, uh, Tony, I, I think the point is nobody ever told them properly. No, I agree. No, no, no. I, I made an interesting experience. Um, I think it was 2006, a couple of years ago, uh, ago already. I was talking to the senior board of a very large car company, and we did an assessment of the whole core application landscape. Mm. Yeah? And of course, they had very high running costs and, and time to system issues and all of that. And we were thinking about this and that, how to do it. Yeah. And I went into this meeting, I had a huge stack pile of slides with code fragments. I pointed out code to the senior board management. Yeah, maybe it's not the right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they loved it. Really? They loved it. I, I had these code fragments. I showed algorithms. I showed dangerous pieces, risk uh, for failures, and this and that. And next to it, I always listed some economic effects on this. I said, That's this, really This is why you're paying the million here. This is why you're using one year development time here. This is why you're doing this and that. No one ever made this visible to, to them before. They understand it super well. You just have to show it to them, and usually it doesn't happen. I actually think that's a really good idea for a PhD. I mean, a, a, a research project. It's visible, understandable. Economical visualization of software cost and potential. Yes. I really like that idea. Yes. So you started in Germany. How many yes. are you now in the test? Uh, about 150. How many non-engineers do you have? I'm just curious. Could be 10, yeah. That's a nice, reasonable level. Right? I think so. Where are you in addition to Germany? We have offices in um, Madrid, mm -hmm. Tallinn, and now Stockholm. No? Yeah, because I know you're a recent That's Swede. That's why I'm here. Yeah, you're yeah. a recent Swede, right? Precise. <laughs> what facets? If I was a manager at the bank or as uh, at um, at the government agency, mm. and I had a budget for for IT or, or digitalization. I would not go to you. I would run to you. I literally, last week, I had a discussion with six people from three organizations. All of them were involved in new projects, replacing old legacy with new systems. Mm -hmm. And they were doing the requirements, talking to people, writing a hundred of pages of specifications mm -hmm. for ordering a new system for huge money. Mm -hmm. And I was like, have you considered fixing your old systems? <laughs> and they were like, no, it's old. Most of all, it's, it's unknown. Unknown. It's, it's not disseminated yet. Mm -hmm. that this is a viable option. So it will take time to understand and it will take many failures. We're not just active in Germany, we are also active in Austria. Yeah? And Austria has a, a population of about 8 million people, mm -hmm. um, which is similar Close to, to Sweden. To Sweden yeah. Yeah? And of course, Germany with 90 million people is, is a different scale. Mm -hmm. And of course, this also reflects strongly in the software systems. I think this is a very, very interesting to see that the size of a software system, of an application, correlates with the, in, I mean, in lines of code, usually correlates with the turnover uh, of a company. Interesting. So if you take two insurance companies, for example, that have a very similar best business, a li two life insurance companies. Yeah. yeah? And you take a large one with 10 million contracts and you take a small one with half a million contracts. Probably the size of the applications will differ the same way. But that's weird. That shouldn't be the case. It is. And the explanation is very simple. Yeah, you only have a certain percentage of your budget that you can spend on IT. Huh? Ah. Because like you have your prime income, mm. then you have to pay the sales people, then you have, of course, pay back to the insured people, and um, administrative costs, and then for, out of these, you can spend a little bit on IT. So they have a scale effect on that. So what you're saying is the more money you have, the more you spend. The more you can spend on IT, and the more you have to, because if you're talking about a market with 100 million people, compared to a market with 10 million people, you get all kinds of different software solutions. But I think government, uh, for example, with, with it, it breaks the model, because... For example, in Sweden, yes. per capita, I would say we invest a lot in many ways. I actually think the more money government has, the less optimized it is. Yes. There is no return on investment. You just increase the tax, uh, really. And, and that's really scary because it, it, it's actually real money you take from people, right? Yeah. Uh, and I'm not saying I, I'm fine with paying tax. I just want my tax money to go to treating cancer children instead of stupid IT decisions, for example, yeah. right? And the fundamental problem there is I don't think it scales in the same way because you can actually invest more money in IT 
which should result in better IT. I'm not sure that's the case. We have some good examples in Sweden, uh, like the tax authorities, believe it or not, really are good at IT. I absolutely believe so. Yeah. They, which surprises me, but I would say there are other sectors in government mm -hmm. which are basically uh, tax funded, mm -hmm. which are waste mega bucks in terms of new systems that they buy which don't work and they need to adapt and they need to reorder and right then mm. we have public tendering which is designed to be non-corruptive good right but the people who order these things don't really know the business right mm. so i i think the renovation um, a business case for renovations is even more important and larger in all government or tax funded i want to um, um, correct something I did not say that in smaller markets there is no need for renovation, but it's, it's different, of course. In Sweden, different renovation, in Sweden, yeah. It's just like in Austria, there are companies that are in strong need for renovation that they do it, we mm. active there. And it's certainly the same in, in Sweden. The point is, but the cultural notion of how to deal with software is a little bit different. My personal experience is that applications in smaller markets tend to be better. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. If you're in a very large market, if you have a very large business, the systems are often written by dozens, if not hundreds of people. In smaller markets like Austria, the systems that are there are written by smaller teams, three people, 10 people, mm. that have a very high identification with the solution. So the, the quality level uh, tends to be actually higher because there's more invested upfront into being optimal, being better. And it's so more on. personal. It's more personal. Yeah. So in many cases, we work together with the customer also. Mm -hmm. yeah? And um, it's particular in smaller markets. Because I meet a lot of companies and organizations, right? Very often here is we need to optimize and improve. And we and the tool of that is digitalization, right? <laughs> it's, it's a very digitalisering, yeah. very Swedish word. And often they have strategies for this and plans and invest a lot of money into figuring out what they should. But they basically very seldom have a clear goal of what they want to achieve. Mm. And they often want to replace or extend something they already have. That's just a very normal thing, especially government. And I get so frustrated when I see, oh, it should have cost 600 million, but in the end it cost 850 and it didn't work. So we had to buy a new one for six, nine, six, another 600K, mm. 600 million. Mm -hmm. And it's like, instead of 500 million in investment, you end up with one and a half billion in investment mm. for the same system. And of course, since it's government money and tax funded, nobody really cares. I mean, yeah, there is officially caring, but in reality, nothing happens. The, and, and so I actually started asking them, do you know you can actually take your current system and actually make it a new system. Mm -hmm. And they're like, who does that? We don't find people who can read the code. Of course so I, you can read the code. Yeah. I mean, yeah but that's but why I wanted this conversation. Willing to do so. Yeah. Yes. But that's why I wanted to have you, this conversation. You can read any code. You can read assembler code. You can read COBOL, PL1, Java. It doesn't matter. No. You just need to have the right um, goal in mind. Like, why are yeah. you doing this? What I really liked when I met you was performance-based. We fix your problems, real problems, mm -hmm. and we get paid if we succeed. And I see the holes especially in government in Sweden, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not saying companies don't need it. I'm saying the obvious choice for government agencies is so obvious for me. I don't understand why they will ever buy a new system because they very seldom have a gap. Okay, we have system here, system here, nothing here. And they no. don't change their business so dramatically. No, yeah. it's the same business, Yeah. right? So that's why I wanted the conversation because I thought it was cool. One last question. Yes. And then I'm going to not torture you anymore. <laughs> AI. Wouldn't the future business model basically be that you rent an AI to fix your problem? I'm absolutely convinced about that. Yeah. But I don't think... But particularly for renovation and yeah. dealing with, let's call it dealing with existing software. Yes. I also think it will have a very, very strong impact on that. And I'm really excited to see what the future brings in this. Yeah. Uh, if we look at what we do during software engineering and, and, and also software um, renovation, many of the tasks we do are not intellectual searching for something like where does this happen yeah yeah that's not really such an intellectual tough question no it just takes it's time a huge searching task yeah. yeah which you unfortunately you cannot complete with a simple grab 
No. Yeah. Because it needs more context, like yeah. um, um, a little bit wider view. Especially when the rules aren't Rap followed. Rap doesn't do, a regular expression doesn't yeah. do, and some building just a compiler, a parser for this is not a good idea because you have too many different questions. And I think all of these questions can easily be answered then soon with the new advanced technologies, call it that way. Yeah. Uh, and we have also made our own experience of uh, experiments with some of the products that are available already, of course. And it's amazing on when you ask, um, um, you know, you throw an unknown piece of code into ChatGPT, of course, today, yeah, and you ask, like, what does it do, like mm. this piece of code? And most times you really get a good answer. Yeah. I'm not saying a perfect, not all 100% correct, yeah? but usually you get an answer that many other people are not able to give. You get a better answer than most people. Trained people. Even then you get better answers, but that's a good starting point. Mm. And that's just today. Think about every bank, every government agency, etc. They have so much legacy that if you take Catestra, Mm -hmm. and you fill it with one billion engineers, yeah. <laughs> right? it's a one billion people company. It'll be a full-time job for all of them just to maintain and renovate software continuously because the second you start, you need to restart, yes. right? Yeah. So I don't see AI sloppily used, right? Mm -hmm. Or the tools, the new technology. I don't see that as a threat. No. I see it as finally giving a companies like Itestra, where you also need a good engineers, good people, good architects, etc., good business people, Mm -hmm. finally giving them the scalability of tool and support to do the job properly. What I dislike about the A AI discussion, right, is people sometimes, even now when it's fairly fresh, they use it as an excuse to postpone investments. Let's not do this now because AI is going to take... No, 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 it's <laughs> no. Not, that's not going to happen. You still need... The concept of renovations is still the same. It's just how fast and how efficient and effective we can be at it mm. that's radically going to change. Of course, I don't have a study for that. But if I, if I had to estimate mm. it, I would say 80% of the work we do in software engineering or renovation, doesn't matter, is not intellectual work. It's, no, it's really it's replaceable. Technical work, um, really simple work, searching, dealing with something that, in our opinion, doesn't work. Yeah? Mm. Just because we made it wrong the first time, mm. yeah, um, and, and so on. So um, there, there's enormous room for improvement, and the technologies that are coming up now are, are pointing or hinting that some of this will at least change. Another way of looking at it is future systems. You're probably going to have AI modules in those systems, which are self-healing or self-fixing, <laughs> right? And, and that also excites me a lot. And I'm really excited about it. I'm also excited the fact that us in Itest, so so Searle and Intestra are actually working together in research. But I think one of the most, um, which I'm looking forward to, is an actual study on AI, right? And the application of AI in production. Instead of having people who are religious about it and say AI is going to solve everything and AI is the future, and then you have other people who are super skeptical saying, yeah, it's just a fad. I much rather, as a researcher, think, what's the efficiency and effectiveness increase of, of, of renovations using AI or not using AI? I literally get invited, I think, every other week. You have to come and talk about AI. I'm like, I'm not an AI expert. <laughs> yeah, but you have ideas about it. And I'm like, yeah, I have ideas about a lot of things, uh, <laughs> but we need to, we need to move now, right? Yeah. Everything is now because yeah, we're now. we're we're getting after. I'm like, yeah. calm down. So that's a really interesting question: is where do we draw the line between people in development and AI in development? And will the people be the creative source and AI do the work, or do you think that AI is going to replace the creative part? Also? I don't have an opinion on that yet. <laughs> <laughs> too early? Uh, yeah, too early. I, yeah. I'm, I'm waiting for that. I, I, I just think, you know, when the first chess computers came up, we were laughing about it. Yes, uh, we were. Nobody's laughing about it now. Especially not uh, Kasparov. You know? <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, I would like to thank you a lot for a great talk. I thank you, Tony. There's huge money in having smart systems in place that actually support your business or your or your operations. So if people are interested in renovations, where do they go? They can ask me or they go to you and yes. you point them to me. <laughs> that sounds good. It's not just a German company. You're now no. becoming Swedish. Yeah, international company. So we have some new rules for you. Yeah. Meatball-based stuff like that. <laughs> I'll explain it to you later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tony. It was a pleasure. You too. <laughs>